drone is part of your toolkit, but it's yeah. obviously not your main thing. I'm curious when you choose, like when do you choose to bring out your drone versus the other things that you use to capture content? For the most part, it's for establishing shots and to mm -hmm. to get that sense of place. And and honestly, they're really they they're for like three to five second cuts of something, and that's about it. Like if we're sh like mm -hmm. um like right now, I'm doing a video on 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 Venice for for my next YouTube uh, series, and I I just have that one drone shot that I want that I know is gonna be like okay, this is Venice, this is where we are, and that's about it. Yeah. And that's so that story surprises a lot of people. But when you start actually, even sometimes like when you're watching a movie or a commercial yeah. or something, a drone is perfect for that establishing shot. Oh, and if for those listening, if you don't know what an establishing shot is, it's basically helping the person to understand very quickly where this whole story is taking place because mm -hmm. a drone can capture a lot of view or right. you know space. Um, and what's interesting is, I was just telling Jacob about a secret project that I'm working on. And what was interesting is even though I'm known for flying drones, they were like, Christine, you can only have one drone shot per video you're creating for us. They're like, we want it exactly as you said, as the establishing shot. And maybe it makes sense to like kind of finish the video with a closing drone shot if it makes sense. But right. generally it's just one three to five second video yeah. per like, per video entire video that I'm creating right. yeah I mean, I mean I like, just with those shots you have to be like because I've noticed what a lot of people do is kind of just throw the, the drone out press record but mm -hmm. because it's such an essential shot for like what you're setting you're setting the pace for everything you really have to think through like your your framing how you're how you're putting like what movement what kind of movement you're doing where you're putting where you're pointing the camera mm -hmm. actually give me an example of a time of like how you decided to set up a shot. I'll, I'll give an example first. So uh, I, I was I, I was creating this video that was supposed <clears throat> to um, be talking about uh, one of the top beaches in the United States. And it's known for its sunsets. Like these sunsets are fire. Mm -hmm. And the way I wanted to set up the shot, originally it was going to be have it super far down the beach, kind of like moving up with the coastline centered. Right. But what I realized might be even more impactful is there's these really beautiful, really, really tall palm trees. And instead I had the drone from behind the palm tree slowly come up to reveal the sunset and all the people on the beach and all of the things that were there. Um, and so this was how I was choosing like, okay, which one might make more sense because, right. you know, you would think at first the palm tree shot, oh, well, you won't even know it's a drone. Yeah. Well, first of all, you don't have to know it's a drone. Right. So a lot of times I use my drone to take selfies while just holding it in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> but then there are other times where it's like, sometimes you do want it to be very obvious that it's a drone, but it doesn't have to necessarily be like, oh, that's a drone shot. You just need something to open the story of where you're at yeah um, tell, tell me an example for you the one that came to mind this wasn't this wasn't even for like a specific video or anything i think it just ended up i just saw a really cool uh just a beautiful potential for a shot and it was on oahu i think it ended up being a reel or something that i made but there was these um rock formations and the, the we were right at the beach and the ocean was coming in and splashing and it was just like epic and I was like, damn, this must look crazy from above. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want it just an, an overhead, right? So what I ended up doing was I started really close to the rocks and then pulled out as the waves were coming in. Oh. So I just had two. And then um, I had I had the, the the break right in the middle of the shot. So then every, you, you got the symmetry. You're pulling up mm -hmm. and you have two kinds of movements happening there. Just to, oh, I just got so goosebumps. <laughs> It was just this very dynamic shot. I'm like, damn, I, I love this. I love that. How how did you center it so that the break would be in the break of the waves would be in the middle? I watched it for. I, I definitely had it up there and just observed for a bit. Saw what, what kind of things the water was doing, and it was probably like an average of where the middle was, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm sure I think there was there was probably something I did in post too, just to maybe maybe cropped in a bit, zoomed, and make sure that it was in the middle. Yeah. So what I love that I'm hearing, because a lot of people ask me, it's like, well, how do you set up your shots? Because most people will do what you're what you earlier said, which is people will just 
put their drone up and then record the whole thing. Yeah. And they have this like 20 minute drone video. And it's like, oh my gosh, what are you gonna do with that? Because for me, like, I don't want to relive that entire 20 minute flight. Right. Uh, Cause sometimes, especially for me, I'll have 10 flights in a day. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that's the entire day. Nice. And so what I would, what I do when I'm setting up shots similar to what you're talking about is I will just look for a long time, not recording, mm -hmm. trying to find that best spot. And then once I find it, I will note. So let's say like, I know that I want my drone to end at whatever height, 250 yeah. feet, for example, I'll note that that's at 250. And then I'll just bring it down to a place where I think looks pretty and will reveal those eventual things, the waves right. breaking and perfectly centered, et cetera. And then I'll just fly it up to that 250 and mm -hmm. then end the shot. And that's normally how um, I get them pretty efficiently. <laughs> I love that. Oh yeah, same. And a lot, what I do actually also is I don't just stick to that area. Like, like that's the shot that I want and that I, I saw, right? And I'll get that no matter what. But I'll move around a bit, you know, maybe like 100 feet this way, 100 feet this way. And I'll yeah. move the camera up just to look around to see what, if, while you're up there, why not see if there's potential for more, yeah. right? Like maybe, why and not? And that's one of the best things, right? Because when you move the drone 100 feet, you physically do not need to move any feet. Yeah. <laughs> like that's one of the best things is like when I'm out there, you know, like doing a time lapse with a camera or something like that, I need to physically go move the tripod to these different right. places. Whereas with the drone, I can lazily sit in the same spot and get all the shots. Okay, all right. Welcome to the drone party. Drones are so much fun and so easy to fly. This is a weekly podcast highlighting drone pilots from around the world with tons of helpful tips to help you become a better drone pilot. And if you're new here, yo, I'm Christine Lozada. I'm your host. I love flying drones and I am so excited for today's guest. Jacob is someone who is not new to drones. He's been flying drones for quite some time, but what's interesting is how he uses his drone as part of his larger toolkit for creating. Let's bring him in. My name is Jacob Segala at Jacob's Medium. I I travel and I have a little content production company. It's and not I, I little and it's fire. You have fire content. <laughs> I'm going to link Thank all you. of his stuff in the show notes below so you can check out and peep his work. Yeah, and, and it's in the lifestyle space, music. I'm still nailing it down, but my favorite is fashion and, and lifestyle just because I get to be the most creative there. Oh, and I, I do that. social social content, ad content, branded content. Just you, it's, If it's there, I do it. Well, what's the best way for people to find you? At Medio on my company website, M-A-E-D-I-O dot C-O. And all of that will be in the show notes below. Yes, 2016 was yeah your whenever first the, like around when the first mavic pro came out because oh, yeah. I, I remember seeing all those announcements and rachel and i were both like holy crap we have to have this thing actually why did you say that back then like what made you so like we you were this was, i think this was one of the first trip one of the first big trips her and i did together we were heading to iceland and scotland mm -hmm. And it was very much like we can't go out there and not have a drone because mm. it is ridiculously beautiful. Yeah. And we need to have this other perspective. Yeah. What happened though? <laughs> no flight, no flight experience. These drones were new. <laughs> I ordered the drone and it didn't get it didn't get to us until the day before the flight. And I had this, I, I supposedly me, I planned like two or three days to learn how to fly it and just go out to a park somewhere. Didn't happen. So all I got to do was unbox it, pack it up, and then we were off. Okay, I'm so excited for the story. Tell me about your first flight. My first flight was actually my scariest flight. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned really quickly that it gets crazy windy in Iceland. Yeah, I bet. And I, I don't know if this was the first one, but it's the one that stands out. It was one of the first flights. We had just finished a tour, an epic tour of one of those volcano tunnels out there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I didn't fly in the volcano, but when we came out, of course, just ridiculous landscape. I'm like, okay, this is my chance. There's no one around. The the app says that's fine. Screw it. Let's go. <laughs> I I throw the drone up maybe like 50 feet or something. Yeah. And it just starts drifting away ridiculously fast. <laughs> I'm pushing back on it. 
<laughs> it doesn't come back to me. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit, what am I gonna do? <laughs> wow. It went it went pretty damn far, and eventually I was I was like, you know, Jacob, fly lower. And, and when I got lower, it got a little easier to push it back. But that mm -hmm. that damn thing was just like, peace, dude. You like how, how far? Me. Like hundreds of feet? Yeah, like... it, it must have been. It was. I mean, it was a dot. Okay, wait, <laughs> wait, like, hold on, oh, shit, hold the phone. Oh, Do you feel like it was because of the wind? I mean, this is a long time ago, so like the way DJI drones operate now are totally different because the first mm. thing that came into my head yeah. is calibrating your drone, especially if you're flying it for the first time. But then I'm like, did that even exist back then that, in the Mavic there was, Pro? There was calibrating for sure. I remember doing the, <laughs> the spinny thing <laughs> yeah, and the yeah. other thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, again, first time doing anything. I mean, I had probably seen, you know, a bunch of YouTube videos, but yeah. I was just excited to get that damn thing up how, in there. How did you get it down from that flight? You just I, ended, I, I dropped it and it mm -hmm. got easier to 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 bring it back. And then of course I was like, no, I can't. I, I didn't get my shot because I didn't even press record before it started <laughs> it started going away. So I was like, I'm doing this again. Yeah. And I, I would just wait for these lulls in wind. And I, uh -huh. I didn't. I was hoping for some epic video footage, but all I got was some like two two pictures. Cause I don't even think I had it in the wrong setting. It was just like, <laughs> you yeah. know what? If you had a very successful first flight, taking it to abroad in Iceland with the Mavic one pro back in 2016, when drones first started existing, I'd be pissed. Like, I'd be <laughs> if you were successful that's amazing but, but i'm like why did i i wish i would have had more time because back in 2016 drones were new yeah like, no one there wasn't there wasn't that many people flying the drones in iceland so there was these signs weren't up everywhere yet mm -hmm. the, yeah. no drone mm -hmm. but i totally wasn't prepared yeah well and, sounds about right but you did it and that's all that I, matters. I did it yeah and it was i think it was like winter out there and there was so many just windy conditions Mm. where I was totally not ready. Like I kept bringing the, I must've mm. flown it. We were there a week. I pro, I've tried flying it maybe 10 times, successfully oh, yeah. maybe three, because mm -hmm. I just wasn't ready. <laughs> wow. Well, I applaud you for continuously trying anyway, right? Oh, yes, yeah, so screw it. Yeah. Like, I was why like as long as I have battery, I'm going. <laughs> The Mavic Pro drone isn't a small drone either, especially as like, no, like your like... first flight. Yeah, it's it's large. Oh, yeah. um, wow. All right. Okay. So let's fast forward. Uh, what are you flying now, and how many drones have you had in between, or are you still flying the Mavic One Pro? The the Mavic gave up on me. When up... and why? For no damn reason. I have really? I have no idea. It was a whole back and forth with DJI that I. <laughs> I didn't, I, I hadn't, I never actually put proper insurance on it, but it must have been two years ago, maybe. Yeah. But it had just been sitting there for three months because we were going to places where I didn't want to, it was like a whole process getting a permit and I just oh. didn't want to. Oh, it. I know how that goes. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, I didn't want to bother doing that. So it stayed here for three months and then it was time to fly it again. And something happened with the uh, one of the sensors. Mm. With, with it just sitting there and it wouldn't calibrate anymore so if, and then it was one of the ones oh, that you wow. had to calibrate and it wouldn't let you go up yeah so yeah oh, that's I, frustrating yeah i got i'm not one to like go off on on customer service but i'm like i did nothing yeah wow that's really frustrating but your drone made it a pretty long number of years oh yeah i made it and it was great and then just the how exponential technology is is kind of is crazy because from the that that pro now i have the air 2 which mm -hmm. is like technically like a, a few a, two tiers down maybe from yeah the top. exactly but this, mm -hmm. this thing is so much better than that one yeah like i'm get, i'm using it for like clients and stuff for for like broadcast level footage i they don't love know they don't, they don't to know the hear that <laughs> it it so I think what you're saying is so spot on because there are so many people that I know actually in two scenarios. One, they're curious about buying a drone and I'm mm -hmm. like, don't buy it 
until you absolutely know you're going to use it. Like don't oh, buy it yeah. and sit on it because they're coming out with them so fast yeah. and the technology is improving so quickly. It's like if you buy one and you don't open the box till next year, which I know a lot of people who own the Mavic Mini one and haven't opened the box. But when that like, one's that, like ancient now. Oh, it's absolutely ancient. It's like having an I iPhone too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think this Air 2 is like, the, the I don't even know the, the latest one, but the smaller one I think is just as good. The and Mini like, 3 Pro, yeah. Right? So yeah. I actually prefer the Air over the Mini 3 Ooh, Pro. Okay, but what's interesting is the Air drone. So I also mm -hmm. know of some people who own the Mavic 1 Pro yeah. who prefer the newer Air drones over those. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, again, like 2016 was like, what, 5,000, 6,000 years ago? Like, <laughs> <so old. Just> about... <laughs> <gasps> All right. So we've talked first flights. And first flight slash scariest flights. Actually, did you? What's your best flight that you've ever had, or was it even the scary ones in Iceland? The best flight. You know, I started looking through my Instagram to, to think of all the flights that I had. But I think it was actually on that trip because it was I mean, it was two and a, it was place. two and a half week two and a half weeks. We spent a week in Iceland and then the rest of the time in Scotland. And one of the places, Scotland was one of the places I've always wanted to go, specifically the Isle of Skye. Mm. And I think it had to do everything with just the trip going up that just led to this view being the, one of my favorite things. But I didn't realize that Isle of Skye was like eight hours away from Glasgow <laughs> where we landed. Wait, hold on. For someone like myself that does not know this place, <laughs> describe what it is and what you can expect to see there. An Isle of Skye, just ridiculous, like fairy tale landscape mm. it, it is it is beautiful probably one of the most beautiful like uh what what is the time right after sunset is that dusk or dawn i never know <laughs> after is, i never dusk <laughs> dusk okay yeah one of the most beautiful dusk dusks i've seen really yeah okay it's and how like, do you how do you get there from glasgow so there's probably a more efficient way to do it, but we had gotten our tickets and then I was like, oh yeah, Isle of Sky, let's go, let's get a car. And again, it was one of those like maybe two, three days before I finally Google it and I'm like, it is a seven or eight hour drive. Holy crap. Oh, wow. So we rented this tiny car and <laughs> drove all the way up there. We were on like the most narrow roads and I was so happy to have a tiny car, but on I think it was like right when we where we're getting in there, we stopped the car in one of the valleys and it was like light rain and but nothing crazy and just light, light wind. So I'm like, this is it. I'm flying the drone. <laughs> and right there, I think was probably one of my favorite, one of my favorite flights, just getting that perspective. Mm -hmm. Cause seeing it from the ground up, already beautiful. Yeah. But, I mean, you're, you, you know, getting that bird's Best view, view in the house. Best oh. view in the house. Oh yeah. I love that. Like, okay, so the it was fact a, that not successful. that many people see it, you know, so you're like, it's extra special because it was a viewpoint. So you get to share that with, with everyone, but not everyone's up there. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, the number of times where I'm like looking at something amazing on my drone from a viewpoint where other people mm -hmm. are also there. And I'm like, if I start showing people what I'm looking at on the screen, I might have a thousand people around me trying to look at my drone. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's pretty good. It's pretty good yeah. what I'm looking at. I would love to hear, and while there's never a, it's always the same settings. I'm sure you have mm. different settings every time. Yeah. Um, but I would love to hear about how you choose your settings on your drone. My guess is you're not shooting in auto settings. Is that correct? Yeah, I'd, I'd shoot in all manual. And I choose, since, since you can't really have like depth that's basically set on, mm -hmm. on a drone, right? All I really do is honestly just change the ISO to match the lighting and I shoot uh, in, in D log or mm -hmm. whatever is D, DJI's uh, log is. And yep. for those that don't know what log is, it's like a very flat version of whatever you're recording that allows you to manip manipulate the col colors in post production. So I'll, I'll just adjust the ISO to like a fine medium mm -hmm. and then bring my vision to life in post production. Do you use filters on your drone? I do, yeah. How, give me an example of how you're choosing which filter for a shot. When it, usually in the middle of the day, when it's just crazy bright and bright out, 
-hmm. and I don't want to, or like the lowest ISO is it can't, can't handle it or the shutter speed. I don't want to put the shutter speed up too much because then it's, it gets a little too, too crispy and it moves away from like that 24 SPS that, uh, FPS mm -hmm. that I like to stick to. Mm -hmm. That's when mm -hmm. I start putting the, uh, the filters, the filters on. on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, I've been playing with filters a lot lately, mm -hmm. but I've also been traveling in kind of rugged places and it's been so rough, usually in the cars or the buses or the boats I've been in that the filters yeah. have been popping off the, the oh. mini three pro. When you put a filter onto the air drone or if you put a filter onto the pro drone, yeah, like it's on there. Like, it's oh yeah, on that there. thing is stuck. Yeah, you gotta like pry it off, but on the like, mini three like you're pro. Break it almost. Yeah, exactly. But the mini three pro, like it's just like, Think it'll come off. <laughs> and I remember a couple of weeks ago, I was I was in the middle of uh, I had just come out of um, a scuba dive in Bonaire, mm. and I was like lifting all of the tanks trying to find the filter because I knew it was under there somewhere. This thing was totally scratched, but I was like, Oh, geez, oh, on, pricey. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I know. I blew on it a little bit and just put it back on. <laughs> And are the, do you, it's ND filters that you're using? Yeah, I use ND oh, okay. filters. Sometimes I'll play with the polarizers. Mm -hmm. It really depends. Um, it depends on exactly what you were saying, kind of like how sunny it is. Right. And for me, like how much glare is on the water. Right. But yeah, that's, think, that's when the polarizers definitely come in. Yeah. But normally I'm just lazy and I just blast it anyway. It's, <laughs> it's a good view. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I keep like a ND three on the on there because I'm flying. I tend to fly a lot in the middle of the day, mm -hmm. and I yeah. think this is my default. Yeah, I usually stick between an ND four or an ND eight mm -hmm. because if you're like me and truly lazy, like you don't <laughs> you don't have to take it off. Like mm -hmm. you can generally adjust the settings to make it look fine once you're in the air. Um, right. Not that it takes a long time to change the filters, but It'll still save you. I, I 30, guess because sometimes you seconds. just want to start flying. Yeah, exactly. Well, sometimes, yeah. always, you just want to start flying. Yeah, just, just blast it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, hold on. What do you use to edit? Uh, Premiere. Premiere oh, Pro. Know. You're so <laughs> professional. You're so professional. Oh, I sometimes love it. it's overkill for like reels and stuff, but like, I, I, I can't help it. And then since I'm shooting in, lo in log, I kind of have to drop them, drop them in there anyway to edit. Yeah, I was going to say, if you're filming like that, you have yeah. to put it in the professional editing software. Okay. But sometimes, because a lot of people ask me <clears throat> what I use to edit, mm -hmm. and I I prefer Final Cut. Uh, I'm trying yeah. to get, I'm trying to be as cool as you in Premiere. <laughs> I honestly just started this past week in Premiere. Um, Final Cut is, Final Cut for those who've never used it before. It's like using iMovie on crack. So okay. it's still, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's still super simple and straightforward and doesn't have nearly as much options to do cool things like Premiere. Um, I really but, like DaVinci too. It, with that, which is even, mm. it's even better for color correction. It's way, it's, I think more streamlined, way more tools. And I think a lot of people end up on Premiere because there's way more plugins and effects and all that made for Premiere. Yeah. But if you don't do a lot of that, I always suggest that people do DaVinci. Interesting. So do you do you switch back and forth between DaVinci and Premiere? Over the last few years, I have, just because I can't decide which one I like more. Oh, that's <laughs> there's even, funny. There's even a flow that I've experimented with where I go from Premiere, export to DaVinci, color grade, and then bring it back. That's just a lot of work. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but lately, lately, it's been all Premiere. That's amazing. All right. Love it. Uh, so I'm I'm the newbie in Final Cut. But even in Final Cut, like I love it just because the editing goes faster. Like I can yeah. I can create uh, a lot of content very, very quickly. So Oh yeah, I get that. Do you know how many drone flights you have? Given oh, it's just okay. one of your tools in your toolbox? I have no idea, but it is not that much. Like, I probably fly the drone in a year, maybe four or five times. Ten if I'm, like, out in Hawaii, like, oh, next yeah. month. Mm -hmm. that I always take the drone there, and I just get some beautiful footage. So yeah, if it's a year where we're in Hawaii, then I'm 
10, 10 to 20 times a year. Wow. It's really not that much. And then since, since actually, since I don't have my, uh, my pilot, my license, mm -hmm. I do it more for a hobby. And then for, yeah. for like my person, my personal brand, the uh, Jake is medium. Mm -hmm. When I do have to have uh, like a proper licensed fight, then I hire out. Yeah. Oh, that is, makes sense. Yeah. Like it, it, it just, if in the middle of all you know production, it's just, it's it just easier to get someone else that's one better than me at it to mm -hmm. licensed. You yeah. Know? That makes sense. That also gives a bit of a hint towards the scale of the awesome projects that you're working on. I love, <laughs> I love to hear that. That's awesome. Um, actually, do you, well, given that you don't fly so much, is there something that you wish you knew about flying drones that you know now that you wish you knew on day one? What would that how, be? How freaking hard it is to fly in some places and not, <laughs> in, not in terms of the conditions, but like the permitting and the process that you have to do. There's, like, there's been places that I take the drone. It's all excited. I think it was Costa Rica. I can't even tell it, but there's been multiple places that I'll take it and you're not allowed to fly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unless you go through a long process yeah. and especially in, it's it's harder even now because people are very aware that drones mm -hmm. exist and they're they're just part of you know, a toolkit so there's way more measures in place and that's probably i think something a lot of people need to be aware of that you can't just <clears throat> buy a drone and start flying yeah i think it's one of the things that a lot of people are very surprised by because you can easily go grab a drone from Costco yeah. <laughs> or from Amazon or pick one up at Best Buy. Um, but they don't understand like what comes with it on the other side. But yeah. the other thing is that because drones are becoming so big, so fast, and it's getting into the hands of so many people, mm -hmm. which is a great thing. Um, the rules are also changing really fast. So whatever the rules are today, are going to be wildly different a week, a month, a year from now. Oh, for um, sure. It's going to be changing super fast. It's hard to keep up, to be honest. Really though, like I yeah. always, whatever I'm going, that's, that's one of my first my first Google searches. It'll mm -hmm. be like Costa Rica drone laws to make sure. Yeah. Like I got. I don't want to be that person. Or I don't think anyone should should be the person that just goes out and flies in places that aren't allowed. Because then you're just, you're kind of promoting that. Yeah. And it's just it's not a good look. No, no, it's not because then it gets other people excited and they want to do it too. Yeah, and it's right? just, yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to push that. Like, it's kind of like at, creating uh, travel content around secret gems. They're not a yeah. secret anymore. <laughs> like, like, like I've been at, at state, not state parks, uh, national parks, and you're you're definitely not allowed there. It's like a five thousand dollar fine. Mm -hmm. People are out there with like the biggest drone they have. I'm like, come on. Come on, bro. <laughs> oh, wow. So what's interesting is every time I've been to a national park, once I'm outside of the lines, I'll always fly my drone because mm. sometimes you'll see like some equally beautiful things. Oh, yeah. But in my content, anytime I post it, I always have to say like this was flown outside of the national park because it was Yeah. Um, because people otherwise, you know, people are like, oh, how are you able to do that? Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. And they come to you for the secrets. Where'd you fly? How can yeah, I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> always. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna always. get you a five thousand dollar ticket. Oh, that's <laughs> on you. <laughs> yeah, I would say like one one thing for me, um, flying in other countries, like mm. it's really hard to find the accurate information out there, especially because it's oh, changing yeah. so quickly. That normally, like my process is, I go to Google and I'm trying to find the equivalent of the Federal Aviation Administration for mm -hmm. that country, which means, you know, it's usually not in English. Right. And so even when you find it, um, well, luckily, usually there's not a different word for drone. So mm -hmm. can I, I can at least do a, like a control find right. for dr the word drone. And then I pull everything into Google Translator yeah. um, to try to figure out what like the latest is. Um, but actually one other thing that that tends to help me because like I, I mean i do it too i talk about my experiences on social media right. or on my blog or on my vlog but going to reddit and like real time mm. hearing what pilots on the ground have to say there right. um can also be helpful because even though like oh yeah like the laws are all good yeah. you know there's no signs you're like you're totally fine to fly here you might be going somewhere where the people who live Ooh, yeah. there are not okay with it. Um, and it's helpful to figure out the vibe. I feel oh, like this is the same thing as when I was traveling during the pandemic. It's like, 
just because it's open doesn't mean it's a good vibe to travel there. Right. Uh, same thing. Oh, straight up. Yeah, wow. people get. I mean, people get weird with cameras alone, and like, there's like a whole another stigma with drones. Mm -hmm. it, it, suddenly, it's not. It's not just a camera. It's surveillance. Yeah. You know? So it's just like a lot. A lot of things you have to work through. Well, with cameras, though, cameras like the word camera is very like everyday versus, uh, and it's not necessarily associated with something bad. Drones mm -hmm. are closely associated with bombs with mm -hmm. war with yep. spying and i was actually recently at like the i don't it was like the american aviation museum in washington mm -hmm. there was a whole section about the history of war drones and it's mm -hmm. like well this is you know this is what we're used to and so right. for example when i went to ethiopia with my drone they were mm -hmm. like in the middle of the tigray conflict there was a huge war going on oh, I brought out my drone very few times and the times I did bring it out, it was like way out in the middle of nowhere, right. but also with no people around because mm -hmm. I knew like the local villagers would, I, I mean, they'd never even seen a tent before. They would come to my tent and touch my tent because oh. they never felt that material <laughs> wow. before. Yeah. I mean, imagine how they would feel about a drone. Like I'm not going to fly this drone around there. Oh, really? Though. Yeah. Um, but I, I knew that I wouldn't even want to be seen with it in my hand in like the cities oh, uh, yeah. in Addis Ababa. So, yeah. I, I wow. took the drone to Lebanon last year. And How'd that go? I mean, Lebanon was amazing. It was a very, very beautiful experience. I mean, and more people need to go out there because you know, in, in, they're in the middle of a financial crisis and they were a country that yeah. relies on, on uh, tourism a lot. But mm -hmm. people have been stepping back because they're afraid of the of the conflict. Yeah, and it, yeah, it's present. It, it can be scary, but if you go about it the right way, and you're just you're not dumb, you're not. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful experience, especially with like like we did it with this uh, tour group called Tour Leb. Mm. Coolest, coolest women in, in Lebanon. Oh, but neat! At one point, I was like, I brought a drone, and I'm gonna ask you, even though I'm pretty sure I know what the answer is. But should I fly it? And they're like, no. <laughs> and I'm like, you can, and we can help you next time. But you need to give, yeah, you, you need a heads up, and you know, get the the authorities, just the right authorities involved, so that they know you're not trying to bomb anything. Yeah, that's yeah. that's about right. Wow, there's a good lot for going, you there's a lot going with the neighbors and inside, you know. So. Yeah, I bet you got good photography and videography on your cameras though so oh i did awesome. i don't I, I don't know if you've seen it but i put a uh one of my not on this my youtube series mm -hmm. my latest episode is on lebanon mm. i am gonna check that out and YouTube. make sure you check the show notes below because i will link that in there as well actually Thanks. you have a few youtube videos that i genuinely love so uh make sure you check out the entire channel i'm, I'm excited for this next one it's on my in my on my hometown venice Oh, Venice oh. Beach, not Italy. <laughs> I well, I didn't realize that you were from LA proper. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, you're California too. I'm in San Diego <laughs> right now, by the way. Oh, oh word. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I just want to pop in and interrupt to say if you're getting some value out of this, please leave a positive review. It really does help to distribute this to more people. And connect with Jacob. His info is in the show notes below. And connect with other drone pilots in the Drone Party Facebook group. And there's one story that Jacob and I talk about later after I accidentally stopped recording, which is flying in Mexico. And he, like myself, we've both flown in Tulum. And one of the things about flying there, especially when you're going to cenotes, is that they will charge you. And the price will vary depending on uh, however they feel, how much they will charge you to bring in a drone. But one thing that's really important is, yes, of course, if you want to pay the price, whatever that might be, do it, but also make sure you're checking your maps because one of the stories that he told me was he paid to go into the cenote to be able to fly his drone, but it was so close to a no fly zone, a military zone that he wasn't even able to launch his drone. And so I'm not surprised that the cenote isn't doing the work for you of figuring out if you can actually fly there or not, but will happily take your money. So noted, make sure you're doing your normal homework on top of 
asking for permission and in these cases, pain to be able to fly in the spots you want to get some footage. Whew. All right, let's get back to it. Yeah, Mexico is amazing. That's a very mixed bag of what the current laws are mm -hmm. because, because their Federal Aviation Administration website, which I have completely Google translated, um, doesn't have very, very clear laws. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of hearsay about what, right. it, what it is or should be. Um, and so it's, it's, yeah, that's one of the places where I'm like, kind of a complicated place to fly yeah. right now i took it to where was it one of the pyramids last year and that was i mean i, I really at least wanted to fly it at the edge of what was okay mm -hmm, but even mm -hmm. then like, people were very anti so i <laughs> i didn't even want to bother I, so hold on I what you're so excited what you're saying right now is something that i think is really important because i feel the same way a lot as well which is like is it worth it right now like, mm -hmm. is the shot worth it versus what can potentially happen? People getting upset or yep. I don't know. A lot of times authorities will come who think they know the laws, but mm -hmm. might not know it, but they just have that stigma around drones. Right. And so they'll say whatever they want to say. Um, I recently had a time, mm -hmm. actually I was, I was staying, um, <laughs> this is while I was living on the bus and we were staying at a yacht club, this sounds very weird, but there were a thousand boats in the area and there was a really beautiful sunrise mm -hmm. in which there was like fog on the water. And I knew that the fog was gonna burn out and it was it was going Ooh, to be very beautiful yeah. in the next six minutes. And so I ran outside with my drone and I looked around and I realized that there were a lot of people who live on their yachts, who were sitting on the back of their boats watching the sunrise. And it was perfectly silent because like we're out in the middle of, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of civilization around. And there were also a lot of like really beautiful geese, like right. dozen, like groups of dozens of them all right. around. And I was like, this is not worth it. Cause even though I can fly here, that I know noise. I'm, yeah, I'm going to ruin it for the geese. I'm going to ruin it for the people. And someone might think that I'm trying to spy on their expensive boat. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> even though it's like, no, that's a pretty good view. Like it's happening <laughs> over there. <laughs> how, yes. how often do you hear whispers of like, or people talking around you, just talking crap about the, the drone whenever you're flying? Cause it's happened to me a lot. Like they won't yeah. see me, you know, like with their, with their remote, but I've heard people be like, Oh, I'm, I'm gonna knock that shit down. I'm like, oh, I wonder, what they're, I wonder what they're looking at. Wait, what do you, what do you do when you hear it? Do you just pretend you, you didn't hear it? <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just like, I remember one dude specifically he was like, I'm gonna knock that shit down. I'm like, bro, yeah, I'm wow. I'm, go ahead and knock it down, but buy me another one. <laughs> Which, by the way, within the last few years, it has now become illegal to shoot down drones, whereas previously it was a legal thing to do. Oh. Um, yeah, but I would say that so that doesn't happen to me, but uh, the reason why is not surprising, and it's because I fly super incognito, uh, whether that means I can see my drone, but no one can see me and I'm not around mm -hmm. other people or, <laughs> yeah, or, um, or something like I will make sure when I blast it, uh -huh. I'm getting the far away shots oh. first. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, while I'm getting those shots, I'm kind of scoping out what's near and around me and going back to the, is it worth it question? Is it worth it to actually get any of these shots? Does it look as good as I want it to? And is someone going to say something mm -hmm. if I do it? Um, and so I'm generally very incognito when I fly. And it's not because like I'm trying to hide anything. It's because you never know what perceptions people have about drones. Yeah. Um, there Actually, there was one time I, I walked 30 minutes to location scout. I should have just sent the drone, but I, I walked and location <laughs> scouted. It was a completely empty beach. And I knew that there was going to be like dolphins or fish or manatees right. on the other side. And when I got back to the car, I sent the drone and I knew that no one was out there. So I was flying low. I was flying all over the place. There were dolphins, fish and manatees, by the way, it was an amazing <laughs> flight. Dope. And I brought my drone back in and I was like, you know, I was folding it up and putting it away. Yeah. And this woman comes out out of nowhere and she was like, 
I saw you out there with that drone watching me when I was on a walk with my dogs. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know you were there. Like, right. <laughs> People don't realize they're like, yay big. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but there's nothing I could have said to tell her, like, uh, I wasn't looking at you. There's an amazing, you know, beach sunrise right. going on with like all these animals. So I was just like, ah, like I, I, you know, I didn't know you were there. I can mm -hmm. tell you, I don't think I captured you at all in my content. Have a great morning. And it's like, there's not really a whole lot else yeah. that you could say. Um, <sighs> drones. Oh. You're my, something oh. I, I remember that I do just to not bother people on for like, if I decide I'm going to fly, I get that thing up in the air and as high as I can, as quickly as possible. That, yeah. Send it, right? Yeah, like, just, just send it and then the adjust. Yeah, although mm -hmm. as long as far as you have your settings allowed or mm -hmm. and legally allowed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then bring it down. That I way do. you get you get to do the scoping, the location scouting all from. I do exactly do. the same thing. Because if you blast it as high as you can, as soon as you um, launch it, then you can also evaluate for yourself. Like how loud is it yeah because so people always ask me like oh well well like you know will will i be able to hear it and it's like it depends yeah. if you're at if you're at that yacht club and it's perfectly silent at 400 feet you're gonna hear it right but in, in other times if you're sitting on the beach and there's huge waves crashing on the oh. north shore great place to fly a drone mm -hmm. yeah at 20 feet you're not gonna hear anything <laughs> And it gives me time to analyze the situation, see how people are going to take it in. Yeah. I, I remember I flew off a cliff out, uh, in Hawaii, actually, and people were loving the drone. Mm -hmm. I, you know, brought it back down, let people look on the screen. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a fun yeah, you, yeah, you never know. Like in the you moments that people are excited. Oh, it's so awesome. Especially kids. Yeah. Like, I love letting kids fly my drone if I have enough battery and I've already right. gotten my shots. <laughs> <laughs> But then you also never know on the other side also oh, for sure we're gonna have a bad reaction wow okay i'm so excited for you to fly your drone in hawaii does your drone have a name it doesn't maybe i, I should name it but i, I feel like not you, to name my things do you well uh, well all my drones were named christine's moneymaker one christine moneymaker two three and four <laughs> i lied that's what i do too for most of mine like most of my things are i had a um, Badass in Spanish, which is chingon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it. <laughs> like my iPhones, iPhone chingon, iMac chingon, <laughs> drone chingon. <laughs> that's, all, that's as far as I go. <laughs> I like that a lot. Oh my gosh. All right, drone chingon. Where where can people find you? At Jacob's Medium. And then Love my it. company at Medio, M A E D I O, Medium. And all of that will be in the show notes below. Thank you for doing this with me. Thank you for having me. This was fun. <laughs> Jacob is such a fire creator. Make sure you check out his work. All of his info is in the show notes below. If you enjoyed this, please leave a review. It really does help this podcast. And join us in the Drone Party Facebook group. And in the meantime, send the drone!